the obvious question is, okay, so much for all the boys and their toys. I promise you that I didn't really care that much about technology. What I really care about is culture and values and who we are and what makes us what makes us tick and all that stuff. Well, so where does this, so the obvious question becomes, well, where does this all take us and when? And um, when you talk to people who are thinking about this, you get three scenarios for the future. Now, these are not predictions. I don't have a crystal ball, unfortunately. But they are credible stories about how the world could turn out in the very near future, given what we know now. And these three scenarios are heaven, hell, and prevail. Now, in the he heaven scenario, there are guys like Ray Kurzweil, for example, who written a book called The Singularity is Near, and he's a classic uh, advocate of the heaven scenario. And what he sees is the possibility that you have all of these technologies taking off like this in our lifetimes. You conquer stupidity, ignorance, ugliness, disease, pain, forgetfulness, and even death. Uh, Ray takes 250 pills a day, and he genuinely thinks he's immortal. He really thinks he's going to live for a very long time. And who knows? Uh, you know, I mean, when you look at the implications of all of these technologies, could happen. There are guys right now, very sober scientists, as is Ray, at, who are at the National Institutes of Health, the National Institute on Aging, and they've got this enormous bet going that the first person to robustly and youthfully live to the age of 150 is already alive today. And, um, and these are sober scientists. Are they right? Who knows? But you know, you're know you already seeing little moments like uh, two years ago, the absolute number of people dying in the United States went down for the first time. Maybe it's a statistical blip, but who knows? I mean, it, what it does reflect is how uh, the big killers like cancer and stroke and heart disease are already being um, uh, affected by all of these technologies and it's already affected aging. I mean who hasn't seen some great grandparents you know in their 80s who suddenly decide to take off for the you know Great Wall of China and you say what's up with this and they say 80 is the new 60 you know and uh, People Magazine just had a cover story with some uh, major babe on the cover, uh, from, you know, from, uh, and she, and, and the, the deal, what was the deal? The deal is from Desperate Housewives. And, and the reason she was on the cover is that she was celebrating her 40th birthday. And you say, you know, didn't used to always be that way, you know, that 40 year olds would end up on the cover of a magazine like that. I mean, or, or, you know, already you're seeing that our sense of what aging is, is already being changed. So, the heaven scenario is credible, could happen, but it's only one scenario. There's also the mirror image, which is the hell scenario. And in that world, they see the same kind of curve of exponential change, but they see it going straight down to uh, either the destruction of the human race within the next 20 years, well, that's the optimistic version. The pessimistic version is the one where you imagine the destruction of all of life on Earth within the next 20 years. And the reason that's credible is because they say, well, you know, you look at the powers of these technologies and you say, well, suppose this gets into the hands of madmen or fools. Uh, you know, already, I mean, there was the Australian mousepox incident, which was this classic example. It turns out that Australia is this isolated uh, ecology that from ten time to time has introduced species that have no natural enemies and they just run amok. It's just, and in one of these examples is mice. Apparently they are from time to time just overrun by mice, mice everywhere. So these Australian scientists were looking to create a mouse contraceptive and instead they created a monster. They made one change in the genetic structure of a, uh, of a, of a disease called mouse pox, a virus. And all of a sudden, this virus became 100% fatal. Every single mouse died. And then they took what they learned and they put it on the internet where anybody can see it. Well, the people who worry about the health scenario, this just drives them nuts because 
Mousepox virus doesn't hurt humans, but it's a very close relative of smallpox, which obviously does. And the information is now on the web, you know, for in principle, you know, to make a smallpox virus unbelievably lethal. Uh, well, that just drives people nuts. So, I mean, one of the lessons here is that if you're dealing with self-replicating anything, whether it's viruses, uh, biological viruses, or information viruses, or robots, or anything else, you better know where the off switch is on this stuff because, uh, you know, you can just imagine a circumstance in which, uh, you know, this technology running amok in a self-replicating way could, in fact, make a very credible hell scenario and could, you know, uh, cause incalculable, unprecedented damage. Uh, but again, now that's heaven and hell, but, and those are, the trouble with those two scenarios, in my view, is that while they're entirely credible, they make perfect sense, they are techno-deterministic, which means that these are uh, ideas that believe that human history is basically driven by its technology and that we're just along for the ride. Could be, maybe so, but there's at least one other possibility, and I call that prevail. Uh, and in the prevail scenario, the notion is that um, we're not, we humans are not just along for the ride, and we're not just uh, uh, the, uh, the pawns of our technologies, that we can influence history and we can make choices in, a, in an important way. And so if you were graphing this, you know, it wouldn't be some nice smooth curve either up or down. It would have reverses and loops and belches and snorts the way history usually looks like. And the, the core of the prevail scenario is the idea that maybe there's not one curve of change. Maybe there's two. The idea is suppose you don't just have all of this change in technology. Suppose you've got a curve that's going right behind it and going up almost as fast, which is human response to this change in imaginative, unpredictable, a bottom-up, leaderless way. And there's reasons for guarded optimism about this in history. For example, if you were looking out at the future of the human race from around 1200 AD in Europe, you'd be pretty pessimistic. I mean, you'd see marauding hordes, and you'd be seeing uh, uh, plagues, and, you know, things look pretty grim. Comes then around 1450, and all of a sudden, you've got the printing press, which is a brand new way of storing and sharing and collecting information. And the effect is amazing. First, you know, you get the Renaissance, and then you get the Enlightenment, which produces science itself and democracy, and the world we live in today, which is dramatically different, you know, from what you were worried about in the Middle Ages. And what's interesting about this is that it was all bottom up. I mean, it wasn't, this was beyond the imagination of any one king or any one country uh, or any one parliament. It was all people who were just doing the best they can. Uh, you know, the people of Venice got run off the land by the marauding hordes. They went out into the middle of the swamp and invented world trade. You know, I mean, it was all kind of ad hoc, bottom up, the, the classic human saga. You see the same thing happened in 9-11. The fourth airplane, Flight 93, never makes it to its target. Why? Because the Air Force is so smart? No. Because the White House is so smart? Hell no. It's because a whole bunch of people on board that aircraft, you know, empowered by their air phone technologies, figured out, diagnosed, and cured their society's ills in a little under an hour flat. Was it an ideal solution? No, of course not. They all died. But nonetheless, it was good enough. And that's at the heart of the question of whether or not you're seeing two curves rather than one. The, the test of the prevail scenario, it's basically a bet on humans being surprising. It's a bet on, it's a faith in humans coming together in unexpected ways, in unprecedentedly clever ways, in a bottom-up way. Um, and the question is, you know, well, do you see any evidence of that? around you and you say, well, um, how about eBay? That's not just the world's biggest flea market. That's hundreds of millions of people worldwide producing incredibly complicated behavior um, in a bottom-up way without leaders. Uh, what about YouTube? 
same thing and it's changing elections it's changing how we think about power um, you know all of the all of the social networking thing is allowing people to produce very complicated uh, results without relying on you know they're not waiting around for some Senate Commerce Committee or something they're not waiting for their leaders a top-down way they're coming up with solutions uh, in a, as best they can as fast as they can and that's crucial to the prevail scenario because if the change is coming at you ever faster the solutions have got to come ever faster too and that's the problem with um, with top-down hierarchies so the test would be for prevail would be the quantity the quality the variety and the complexity of ways that humans find to connect uh, the test would be you know interesting group behavior groups not individuals it'd be like watching a flock do amazing things and the significance of this it's occurred to me is that you know we've got a long way to go and not a whole lot of time to get there this I, I submit you know if you look at these at these at these trends so uh, it's occurred to me to wonder you know we can't find any other evidence of intelligent life in the universe and I wondered about why that is I mean you know where is everybody and uh, it occurred to me to wonder well maybe all intelligent species get to this point where they take control of their own evolution and take control of really who they are in a really basic way maybe this is the final exam maybe everybody else is flunked that's not us flunk the third technology is the eye and the grin technologies and that's information technology and uh, of course anybody who's got a computer is familiar with the underpinnings of this but what's amazing is how quickly this is becoming part of what it means to be human uh, for example for uh, m almost 20 years now there have been devices called cochlear implants and these are basically computers that fit into your ear and go directly into your nervous system this is for people who are profoundly deaf I mean they've got nothing in their ear that works so you can amplify all you want and it won't help them what a cochlear implant does is pick up the signal turn it into a digital image and pipe it directly into your brain and there are now more than 30,000 Americans with these things and it completely changes their lives and in 2004 the FDA approved similar technology for ocular implants and these are uh, tiny cameras that go directly into your retina and allow the profoundly blind to see um, I mean what's what's amazing about all this about information technology is that I mean I don't know if there's anybody is anybody old enough to remember when a music player required three or four great big boxes covered with walnut remember you know those that and now and then of course a music player became something that you carried like a Walkman and now you know it's a piece of jewelry like the uh, like the Nano or the Shuffle uh, that's because you know because of Moore's Law these capabilities uh, just get cheaper and cheaper and smaller and smaller pretty I mean it's just a matter of time before these become earrings well what's interesting about this is that there's no end of other technologies that are right on the heels of this for example in uh, Afghanistan right now American troops carry universal translators they're little um, uh, basically laptops that have got 5,000 words of, of uh, uh, that can translate in both directions in about 16 languages over about 5,000 words so if you, you can say where's the bad guy and you know it will output it will it'll talk to whoever you're talking about in their language and then and they reply it, it'll understand just fine and then explain it to you in English well if this fit and it's not cheap and it's not small yet but because of Moore's law you know you can easily imagine the point at which you know that too becomes an earring once you have a universal translator the question becomes uh, suppose you know what happens when this gets offered in the next five or ten years as a as an implant inside your skull suppose you could buy an implant that would make you fluent in Chinese would you go for it 
when I ask this question, you know, there's this long pause, and almost every time half the population raises their hand. You know, they're willing to take, to, to have an implant. Uh, and the same thing goes with memory chips. Uh, you know, if you could buy a few gigabytes of, you know, who couldn't stand to use a couple of extra gigabytes of, of memory? And, uh, and, of course, one of the things that DARPA is interested in is allowing you to see what the robots can see, you know, from far away. So uh, you can easily imagine a circumstance in which a researcher could uh, look at the rings of Jupiter through a robot as if she were there. And um, that's a pretty amazing. And this, again, this is not, I know it sounds like science fiction. One of the problems I have with this stuff is that is convincing people that, you know, that of what actually exists much less what's in the pipeline. Um, but I mean, Larry Page and Sergey Brin, the, the, the co-founders of Google, uh, back in 2004 were telling Newsweek, uh, you know, where can you go with this? Quote, certainly if you had all the world's information directly attached to your brain or an artificial brain that was smarter than your brain, you'd be better off, end quote. In 2005, they said, quote, why not improve the brain? Perhaps in the future we can attach a little version of Google that you just plug into your brain, end quote. Now, you know, back then people thought they must be kidding. Oh no, they're not. All right, that takes us into the fourth technology, which is nanotech. And this is the least developed of the four. What nanotechnology is about is directly controlling matter and energy. It involves taking uh, molecules and atoms and putting them wherever you want them in a fashion such that you can create from scratch anything you want. Anything you want. Diamonds, molecularly accurate T-boat stakes, uh, spaceships, you know, whatever you want, one atom at a time. Now, this is this is one of the most transformative. All four of these technologies, of these grin technologies, tend to, you know, are not discrete. The, the information technology feeds into the biology, which feeds into the nanotechnology. It all is, but it's all happening on a curve. And um, uh, nanotechnology, according to the congressional study, is expected to be a one trillion dollar a year business by 2015, which, for comparison's sake, is about the size of the GNP of Canada. And what's interesting about nanotechnology is that the more urgent our issues, the more promise this holds. Uh, a classic example is energy. Um, there is a company, for example, called Nano Solar Inc., which has got, uh, uh, which is now producing commercial quantities of great big sheets of plastic on which are printed uh, nanoscale uh, uh, circuits that takes sunlight and turn it into electricity and when it's a, a fully at scale it's supposed to be at the same price as coal or nuclear so you know you're talking about big flexible sheets of plastic that can produce electricity that you can put anywhere you want on your roof on your car on your lawn you know out in the desert in Arizona whatever you want I mean think about how many uh, companies have been upended by technology in the last 10 or 20 years. Think about, you know, the record industry or the newspaper industry or God only, well, think of what happens to the future of the electricity businesses when you no longer have to own a nuclear reactor, you know, to have electricity. Suppose it becomes distributed and bottom up the way technology has upended all these other things. It, it fundamentally changes a lot of the equations. Um, and a little bit farther down the road, like 10 or 15 years, one of the promises of, of nanotechnology is to create uh, na nanobots, as they're called. These are robots that are smaller than a human blood, uh, blood cell, and you could put millions of them in your bloodstream, and the first generation would be watchdogs. They'd be going through your, um, uh, through your bloodstream looking for uh, a cell that was just becoming cancerous years before you had any symptoms. The second generation would be hunter-killer bots, which would go in and not only recognize a cancerous cell, but be able to attack it. 
or anything else you wanted, like fat cells. Again, I don't know why I'm keep on talking about fat cells. <laughs> my personal obsessions, I suppose. But <laughs> but anyway, but the, I mean, think of think of how that changes medicine. Um, the um, I mean, it just kicks it just kicks robot robotics in this case just kicks genetics into a new orbit. So we humans look all different. As you can see from here, many different people, and including my small group of students who look different, behave differently, and they are susceptible to uh, different diseases, mainly due to this 0.1% difference in DNA sequence, which is of 3 billion base pairs. You're looking at an eye, which lost the eye vision because of the genetic disease called Abellino corneal dystrophy. If one of your parents have this genetic mutation, you will not be blind. However, if you receive LASHI, you will become blind in two or three years. So diagnostics early is very important. It can be done very easily by swapping some inner cells from your uh, mouse, and then uh, you uh, do the PCR amplification of the DNA region, and then you hybridize it with prepatenancing. Using this technology, we tested more than 440,000 patients who tried to receive LASHI, saved 413 people from becoming blind. Also, you can use it for testing other genetic diseases, such as Wilson's disease, which is caused by accumulation of heavy metal ions, and you lose functions of your brain and liver. So that needs to be identified early in the stage so that the child can be treated with proper medicine. You can apply this diagnostic technology for the identification of exact pathogenic microorganism so that you can administer the right antibiotics without causing antibiotic resistance problems, which is becoming more and more significant and also dangerous. Now, this can be done in more nanotech-based way. For example, you can make a nanopatterned chip, which uses technology called LSPR, and then you can use aptama immobilized on the chip, which will specifically capture only the specifically designed pathogenic microorganisms. Now you get the very simple way of testing it. We eat vegetables, fruits every day, and you probably did it today too. Sometimes these are contaminated with toxic agrochemicals, which is not good. Can we test it? Well, yes, you can do it by the, uh, using nanotechnology. You can make a very inexpensive disposable chip, which has immobilized enzyme that can detect such toxic agrochemicals. Not only diagnostics is the application of marrying nanotech and biotech. You can produce something. Based on nanotech, for example, you can identify beautiful metal nanoparticles that can be synthesized by various microorganisms, which is, of course, engineered to accommodate such heavy metal ions and make something useful, as shown in this slide. So you can incubate cells with a diverse portfolio of metal ions. You can make quantum dots. You can make metal na na mag magnets. You can make some uh, nanoparticles which have never been synthesized by chemists but microorganisms are capable of doing it. Now you can have various applications, but you want to mass produce it to make money. How you do that? Well, you're looking at cells which are growing in a bioreactor. You're looking at the highest cell density cultivation, which contains about 400 billion cells per milliliter of bros, which is probably equivalent to filling this room with 500 people and make them uh, live happily for 200 years. You can use high productivity system to produce something such as this one, that is muscle glue protein, which can be used as a water resistant super adhesive. Now you can clone this gene into E. coli, and based on nanotech, you know the structure you want to have. You can have a system that allows production of the strongest natural fiber uh, around, that is spider silk. That is as strong as Kevlar, which is the strongest man-made fiber. You have bulletproof best applications, parachute ropes. You can have biomedical applications. So actually, applications are endless. Now, to make this, if you look at the DNA sequence and also amino acid sequence in the protein, it is very nasty. So you cannot allow cells to produce it. Now, you can metabolically engineer cells to overproduce this and eventually you will be able to produce enough amount using high cell density culture, and then you spin them out to get it actually delivered. So marrying nanotechnology and biotechnology not only give you very robust, simple, inexpensive, accurate diagnostics, 
but also production of very useful, highly functional materials from sustainable resources. Thank you very much. Carbon nanotubes are a fantastic material. Light, strong, small, highly conductive and versatile, they're finding uses in everything from lightweight composites to high performance batteries and touch screens to drug delivery systems. But how safe are they? Research is increasingly showing that the wrong carbon nanotubes in the wrong place are potentially bad news for your health. The trouble is, this isn't much help without knowing what a wrong carbon nanotube looks like and what the wrong places are. The trouble is, carbon nanotubes are not just carbon nanotubes. They might be short, long, thin, fat, straight, curvy, tangled, spiderweb-like, bunched up in a tight ball, single-walled, multi-walled, big clumps, small clumps, or almost any combination of the above. And the risks they present depend critically on what type of carbon nanotube you're looking at. A very long, thin, straight, multi-walled carbon nanotube, for instance, is a completely different beast to a spiderweb-like cluster of single-walled carbon nanotubes. On top of this, chemistry matters. It's easy to think carbon nanotubes are just carbon, so what? But in addition to the supreme importance of how those carbon atoms are arranged in the material, carbon nanotubes often come with additional chemical passengers. These might be metal nanoparticles used in their production, or chemicals added to their surface to make them easier to work with, or even drug molecules inserted into their core to create more effective therapeutics. In all cases, the specific chemistry of a given carbon nanotube is rather important. Then there's the question of where the carbon nanotubes are used, and how they are used. It's easy to imagine how someone might breathe in carbon nanotubes while handling them as a powder. Harder if that powder has been suspended in a liquid or formed into hard pellets, though. And once the nanotubes have been used in a product, like a battery electrode or a carbon composite bicycle frame, it's much more difficult to understand how a significant exposure might occur. Especially as this material is often used in extremely small quantities. And because of their size, shape and chemistry, you need to work really hard at pulling carbon nanotubes out of a product once they're in it. And when you do, they don't often look the same as the material that went in, which means that research on the toxicity of freshly generated carbon nanotubes may not tell us what we need to know about the hazards of those that are released from products. The bottom line is that not all carbon nanotubes are created equal and any residue of risk equity that might exist is further eroded by how they are used. Which leaves us with a rather large challenge. As we learn more about what makes carbon nanotubes toxic, what do we need to do to understand more about who is likely to be exposed to what and how exposures can be reduced to acceptably safe levels. Because without this, the responsible development and use of carbon nanotubes is going to be tricky, to say the least. For more information on carbon nanotubes, check out the links below and stay safe. Are silver nanoparticles good or bad for you? To help answer this, we thought we'd round up seven facts about silver nano that may surprise you. 1. Silver nanoparticles are released from silverware. Drink water from a silver jug or eat with a silver spoon and you are drinking and eating silver nanoparticles. As silverware has been around since Roman times, we've been doing this for a couple of millennia now. And of course, if you were born with a silver spoon in your mouth, you've probably been doing it more than most. 2. People have been intentionally dosing themselves with silver nanoparticles for over a hundred years. Colloidal silver, suspensions of silver nanoparticles in a liquid, were popular before modern antibiotics came along. Their use has become widespread again in recent years as a cure for, well, if you read the claims, almost anything apparently. There is no clear evidence that drinking colloidal silver is good for you, but the evidence never stopped people from self-medicating before. 3. 
Silver nanoparticles are pretty good at killing microbes, but it's the silver ions that they slowly release that do most of the damage. This means you don't necessarily need nanoparticles to make products that kill bugs using silver. For instance, the Michigan company Krypton makes commercial fabrics used everywhere from Hyatt hotels to McDonald's that use silver ions to inhibit bacterial growth. And products using ecstatic silver technology are widely used by athletes, the military, medics and others. Both companies use silver as an antibacterial agent, but as far as can be told, neither company uses nanoparticles. 4. It's hard for pathogens to develop resistance to silver nanoparticles because they interfere with microbes in multiple different ways. However, indiscriminate use of silver as an antibacterial agent could still increase the chances of resistance developing, which isn't great news if you're relying on it to protect particularly vulnerable patients. 5. If you're exposed to enough silver, it'll turn your skin blue, a condition called argyria. This is cosmetically interesting, but not fatal. In fact, it's thought that royals were originally called blue bloods because, you guessed it, those silver spoons turned their lips a delicate shade of royal blue. 6. Silver nanoparticles aren't likely to be much more dangerous than other forms of silver in the human body, as it's the ions that cause the most damage. Although it's still possible that research may throw up some surprises. Nanoparticles, for instance, might find it easier to get to sensitive places like inside cells before dissolving and releasing their payload of silver ions. And we may still find that the nanoparticles trigger the body's immune system in ways that ions do not. That said, a couple of millennia of imbibing silver nanoparticles hasn't thrown up any obvious risk red flags yet. 7. In contrast, silver is bad news for the environment. We learned this with environmental contamination from the photographic film industry. Silver nanoparticles are at least as harmful as the same amount of silver in any other form, possibly more so if the nanoparticles can get to places other forms of silver cannot. This has got some people wondering whether putting silver in everything from socks and kids' toys to bedsheets and carpets is a bad idea. To learn more about silver nanoparticles, check out the blog below. And as always, please do join the conversation in the comments. We've already talked about the basic rules of magnetism and some of the ways we use it in science and technology. But the most exciting applications of magnetism are in the new field of nanotechnology. Advances in nanomagnetism are beginning to change the way we use computers and electronics, practice medicine, and even create artwork. We saw earlier that information can be stored by magnetizing very small regions of a hard disk or some other storage medium. Each of these regions corresponds to one unit of information called a bit. If we want to store more data in a smaller device, we have to reduce the size of these regions. Magnetic regions are each composed of small, densely packed particles called grains. If we make the grains smaller, the magnetic regions get smaller too. But if we try to make them too small, we run into an obstacle. Ambient heat causes atoms and small particles to constantly and randomly vibrate. It's possible for a very small grain to pick up enough energy from these vibrations to reverse the direction of its magnetic field. The smaller the particles, the more likely this is to happen. This is called the superparamagnetic effect, and it's a big problem for really tiny grains. If enough of the grains in a magnetic region get knocked around, the whole region may change its polarity. This causes the value of the bit to change between 1 and a 0, which is called bit flipping. The density of the information on the disk is limited by the size of the magnetic regions. This, in turn, is limited by how small we can make the grains before they become vulnerable to the superparamagnetic effect, which cause bit flipping. Right now, magnetic memory, like the hard drive in your computer, is limited to about 19 gigabytes per square inch. 
If we could reduce the surface area without reducing the volume of the individual magnetic regions, we could fit more of them into a smaller disk and store information in less space. This is done by replacing the flat magnetic regions with densely packed vertical cylinders on the disk. Each cylinder represents one bit. The goal is to increase their height while keeping their cross section as small as possible. This way, the magnetic regions have enough volume to keep them stable while still presenting a small surface area to the reed head. For this to work, the cylinders have to be very small and precisely arranged. The Center for Hierarchical Manufacturing at UMass Amherst is developing a nanoporous template which could hold tiny magnetic wires that would act as magnetic regions. The template forces the wires into a very precise pattern. The process relies on an important property of nanoscale materials called self-assembly. Under the right conditions, certain types of molecules organize themselves into shapes and patterns. The template uses a type of polymer that arranges itself into a regular pattern of cylinders when it's heated. The cylinders are dissolved to create pores. Then, we deposit metal into those pores. These nanoporous templates could vastly improve computer memory. Recently, computers and other electronics have been becoming exponentially smaller and more powerful. Basic electronic components like transistors and logic circuits, have been made about a million times smaller. However, transformers and power supplies remain bulky and inefficient. So what is it about transformers and power supplies that keep them from getting smaller? Unlike transistors and logic circuits, transformers and power supplies use permanent magnets. We've already seen that neodymium and other new magnetic materials have let us shrink large headphone speakers which also rely on permanent magnets, into tiny earbuds. Neodymium magnets have made transformers and power supplies and other magnetic devices somewhat smaller, but they still lag far behind purely electronic devices like transistors. If we want to make them smaller, we'll need even stronger magnetic materials. In a magnetic material, the atoms clump together into magnetic domains. Each domain has its own field. If the material is not magnetized, magnetic fields are arranged randomly and cancel each other out. When the material becomes magnetized, the domains line up, but not perfectly. There is still some cancellation. To make the magnet more powerful, we have to improve the alignment of its domains. It is possible to arrange magnetic materials so that their atoms work together. This is caused by the principle of exchange coupling, which requires that we keep the particles in a very precise position and alignment. This is difficult, but new nanomaterials are being developed to hold them in place. With smaller, more powerful magnets, we can make smaller, more powerful transformers. These magnets could also be manufactured as pastes and films that could be built directly into microchips instead of being soldered onto circuit boards. Medical applications of magnetism and nanotechnology may be the most exciting and inspiring of all. Right now, many disease detection and treatment methods are invasive and damaging. Nanomagnetism offers us harmless, non-invasive, and less traumatic alternatives. Magnetic resonance imaging, or MRI, is very useful for detecting cancer, but it has trouble finding the smallest and most easily treatable tumors. Scientists are trying to increase the sensitivity of MRIs by attaching slightly magnetic nanoparticles to the cancer cells. These nanoparticles are called contrast agents because they make even tiny tumors show up clearly in the MRI. One way of creating these contrast agents is to take a harmless virus whose outer shell bonds easily with metal ions. The virus is coated with magnetic particles and then with other particles that bond with cancer cells so that it will stick to any tumors that it comes across. When a tumor becomes surrounded by these tiny magnetic viruses, it is very easy to spot with an MRI machine. Nanomagnetism is also opening up new methods of treatment for cancer and tumors. One technique uses tiny bits of magnetic rust to target and destroy cancer. First, we take iron oxide particles 500 times smaller than a red blood cell and give them a special coating that makes sure they won't clump together 
and that they'll be absorbed by cancer cells. When these coated particles are injected directly into a tumor, they spread out in the spaces between the tumor cells. Next, we apply an alternating magnetic field. The magnetic field makes the particles vibrate quickly, working themselves deeper into the cracks between the cells and even helping them get absorbed into the cells. But the vibrations also cause them to heat up. As the particles get warmer and warmer, the heat destroys the cancer. The waste is cleaned up by the body's natural systems. Nanomagnetism could even make life easier for diabetics and other people who have to inject themselves with medicine. Future technology could make it possible for them to release drugs into their system with nothing but an external field. One possible technique is to implant a small capsule of medicine wrapped in a porous membrane. The pores are filled with a gel that contains tiny magnetic particles. When an alternating magnetic field is applied, the particles in the gel start vibrating and heat the gel up. The gel contracts, opening the pores and letting the drug particles escape into the bloodstream. When the magnetic field is turned off, the gel cools down and expands to fill the pores so that drug delivery is stopped. Nanomagnetic effects can also be used to create artwork. Ferrofluids are magnetic liquids that are being used by artists like Sachiko Kodama to create cool effects because they react to magnetic fields. Ferrofluids are attracted to magnetic objects and in a strong magnetic field they form spikes and ridges that follow field lines. The liquid will follow a moving magnet or respond to changing current in an electromagnet. A ferrofluid is made by suspending tiny particles of iron, hematite, or some other magnetic metal in oil. The particles are coated in a surfactant so they won't clump together, otherwise a strong magnet could pull them right out of the oil. The spikes come from a complex interaction of forces. The magnetic force wants the fluid to follow the field lines, and the surface tension wants to make its surface area as small as possible. A ferrofluid's characteristic spikes are the compromise. If we strengthen the magnetic field by bringing the magnet closer or adding another magnet, the number of spikes increases. We are seeing the magnetic field lines in three dimensions. When the field is stronger, the lines are more densely concentrated. If we weaken the magnetic field, the number of spikes decreases, and they are further apart. The magnetic field lines are less densely concentrated. If you place a large screw in the ferrofluids and apply magnetism, the fluid will climb up the threads. This is because the magnetic field is focused by the shape of the thread and is stronger along its sharp edge. These demonstrations are easy to do with some ferrofluid and neodymium magnets. Proper safety precautions should be taken. Ferrofluid is not hazardous or toxic, but it is messy, can stain clothing, cause mild skin irritation, and is flammable. When combined with strong magnetic fields, it can behave unpredictably, so always wear gloves and safety glasses when handling. It can usually be cleaned up with water and household cleaners, but you should not use it around nice furniture, carpets, or fabrics. Ferrofluids have many practical applications, such as seals held in place by magnetism to keep dust out of hard drives and delicate machinery, or as bearings to keep audio speakers from overheating as the coil moves back and forth. However, our interest now is in ferrofluids as art media. Because they can be manipulated with magnetism and change their shape in such fascinating ways, ferrofluids promise to open new avenues of human expression. Working with ferrofluids on a large glass surface, these artists are using powerful neodymium magnets held underneath to draw the fluid out in long tendrils, create bold shapes, and interact with colored inks and other materials. Very subtle effects can be created depending on the strength and shape of the magnetic field.
for the first time. Maybe it's a statistical blip, but who knows? I mean, it, what it does reflect is how uh, the big killers like cancer and stroke and heart disease are already being um, uh, affected by all of these technologies. And it's already affected aging. I mean, who hasn't seen some great grandparents, you know, in their 80s who suddenly decide to take off for the, you know, Great Wall of China? And you say, what's up with this? And they say, 80 is the new 60, you know. And uh, People Magazine just had a cover story with some um, major babe on the cover. Uh, from, you know, from, uh, and, she, and, and the, the deal, what was the deal? The deal is from Desperate Housewives. And, and the reason she was on the cover is that she was celebrating her 40th birthday. The obvious question is, okay, so much for all the boys and their toys. I promise you that I didn't really care that much about technology. What I really care about is culture and values and who we are and what makes us what makes us tick and all that stuff. Well, so where does this so uh, Ray takes two hundred and fifty pills a day and he genuinely thinks he's immortal. He really thinks he's going to live for a very long time. And who knows? Uh, you know, I mean, when you look at the implications of all of these technologies, could happen. There are guys right now, very sober scientists, as is right, at, who are at the National Institutes of Health, the National Institute on Aging, and they've got this enormous bet going that the first person to robustly and youthfully live to the age of 150 is already alive today. And, um, and these are sober scientists. Are they right? Who knows? But you know, you're already seeing little moments like uh, two years ago, the absolute number of people dying in the United States went down. Birthday, and you say, you know, didn't used to always be that way. You know, that 40-year-olds would end up on the cover of a magazine like that. I mean, or, or you know, already you're seeing that our sense of what aging is is already being changed. So the he heaven scenario is credible. Could happen but it's only one scenario. There's also the mirror image, which is the hell scenario. And in that world, they see the same kind of curve of exponential change, but they see it going straight down to uh, either the destruction of the human race within the next 20 years, well, that's the optimistic version. The pessimistic version is the one where you imagine the destruction of all of life on Earth within the next 20 years. And the reason that's credible is because they say, well, you know, you look at the powers of these technologies and you say, well, suppose this gets into the hands of madmen. The obvious question becomes, well, where does this all take us and when? And um, when you talk to people who are thinking about this, you get three scenarios for the future. Now, these are not predictions. I don't have a crystal ball, unfortunately. But they are credible stories about how the world could turn out in the very near future, given what we know now. And these three scenarios are heaven, hell, and prevail. Now, in the he heaven scenario, there are guys like Ray Kurzweil, for example, who written a book called The Singularity is Near, and he's a classic uh, advocate of the heaven scenario. And what he sees is the possibility that you have all of these technologies taking off like this in our lifetimes. You conquer stupidity, ignorance, ugliness, disease, pain, forgetfulness, and even death. Um, 